from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Michael Cunningham has written a new book called um, A Wild Swan and Other Tales, and he's brought his friend Yuko Shimizu, who has done extraordinary illustrations for the book. Um, you know, like you all, I, I know Michael through his work and through his books. I've been lucky because I was also able to publish some of his fiction and nonfiction over the years as an editor. But also, um, I just wanted to, to pass on, so tw it was exactly 20 years ago that I got to study with Michael for a week at, at Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. And so what you do is you send in two short stories and, you know, as an audition, and you hope that they go over well and that he accepts you. And so it was my um, good fortune to, to have that happen. So, you know, we were already in awe of Michael because of the two books that we knew. And so from the very first day he came in and he started talking about this other book that, this other book that he was working on. And he said, you know, it's got Virginia Woolf in it and it has ghosts. I don't really know what I'm doing, but, um, but I'm, I don't know. I kind of love it and I'm into it. And, you know, we'll see who knows what it's going to be. And for those of us aspiring writers, you know, just to hear an author like this, you know, won't give us any crumbs at all, was just remarkable. And, you know, he was kind of showing us what it is to be vulnerable and to also have a project that you're not necessarily always in charge of, but the work is the thing. And he said, you know, I'm just, I'm just, it feels right. I don't know where it's going. And, and so we were just kind of knocked out by that. You know, we felt in those, in those days, like we were part of his circle and, um, Michael said a, a couple of things during that week that I just want to share with you because they've stayed with me ever since. And one of them was, you know, he was just talking about his writing at some point. He said that he basically considered any paragraph that he wrote to be, or what he wanted it to be, was a bouquet of sentences. Now, I never heard that before, and I've never heard it after. And if you know Michael's work, you know just how true that rings because Michael is such an incredible stylist and he shapes his sentences so beautifully and, and what he was saying was the effect of a paragraph, you know, it's not that every sentence is trying to outdo the other sentence, it's how you put them together, it's the effect. And he, that whole week he was so trying to kind of push us toward imagery that was startling and original and he said, you know, if you, if you write a line and it says lips um, are as red as apples, then you know that's not good enough. You have to push yourself. You don't want anything that's familiar. And so that had a, a huge impact on me as a, an aspiring writer. And the other thing, uh, a little bit more perverse that he shared was, so, um, you know, so you send in these two short stories and at the end of the time or at some point in the time, he talks to you about them. And so we were always in anticipation of, oh, have you had your time with Michael yet? You know, and so mine was at the very end. And so we sat down and, and he, had, he had my two manuscripts and he said, so, okay, okay. And he read them and he said, you know, basically I think that this short story, th this story, and he held the other one up and he said, and I, I think that this story should, and I wasn't quite sure where it was going and I, I can't say the actual word that he said, but since we're in Washington, I'm, I'm gonna choose uh, have relations. So he said, basically, I think that this story should have relations with this story. And what comes out of that is what you should be doing. <laughs> so when you've heard something like that, you can never quite look at eight and a half by 11 paper quite in the same way. <laughs> um, but, it, but I also understood what he was saying. And so, you know, in, in many ways, what I've been trying to do ever since then is work on the baby for those two stories. Anyway, so as you know, I mean, so Michael, that book that he was talking about then went on to be The Hours and went on to win the Pulitzer Prize. He is the author of other books such as Specimen Days and um, Darkness Falls and um, The Snow Queen and a, and a beautiful book about Provincetown and the spirit and beauty of that town. And Yuko, whose, whose work, you, I mean, basically you, you know her work from everywhere you look. She's had her work in Rolling Stone, in The New Yorker, the cover of books, um, Time and News, Newsweek, but also she's created this incredible poster. So hopefully she can talk to us a little bit about that. So let's welcome them to the stage, Michael Cunningham and Yuko Shimitsu.
Thank David, you. thank you. That was so great. By the way, turned out awfully well. I have the temerity to be <laughs> proud of you. That's right. Um, I, I, am I, am I, t tell me if I, tell me if I'm not audible in the back, okay? Um, but yeah, yeah, 20 years ago, right. two stories got married and produced generations <laughs> of younger stories. I right. remember, I remember t that conversation. So stories, I mean, you know, a lot of us, um, who are short story lovers have, have wondered when Michael might ever publish a short story collection. And, and here we have it. This, so this is it. This is the, the book. And, um, when the, and so basically, you know, I kind of think of this book as, as Michael being a great jazz pianist who's playing the standards, which is to say there are some, some stories that, you know, he maybe plays a little bit straighter. Some he, he totally reverses. Uh, some he bends the uh, the bridge or the verse, and some he just totally reimagines. So I mean, it's thrilling to see what he does with each story. Each story is different. And but so one of the things, Michael, I, I wonder about is um, so in this book you have kings and jesters and spells and castles, but you also have clothing by Marc Jacobs, right? And subway turnstiles and apartments with cable and apartment. Uh, you know, bars where people go for hookups. And so I'm wondering if, there, if you felt like you had to establish any kind of rules going into it, how the contemporary would speak to or intersect with the, the traditional kingdoms and things. You know, that was one of those things that sort of came out as I, as I wrote. Um, you know, these are these sort of reinterpreted, reimagined fairy tales. And as far as I can tell, the, most of the, uh, the fairy tales I knew as a kid, most of the ones I, I sort of retold in this book are medieval kings, castles, you know, yeah, sort of vaguely 13 to 1400s. Um, and there was something that's hard to, some, some of this stuff is hard to be specific about. It felt a little kitsch setting them in their original fairy tale time. Uh, but, I, but then it also felt sort of contrived to set them in contemporary times. Um, you know, you're kind of damned if you do, damned this way and damned that way. And I thought, you know, if, I, um, if there are kings and castles and, and laundromats and strip malls, maybe it will just sort of lift them out of time. Uh -huh. So that by, by the juxtaposition of, of, of our lives now and the 14th century, we're not sort of thinking so much about the time in which these stories take place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be any time. Sure. And, and so were the stories completely finished before you turned to Yuko? Or was she brought into the process at some point? Or, or talk, talk about how how she became part of the, the book. Well, I would love to turn it over to Yuko, but the stories were pretty much finished, and um, it was clear that a book of fairy tales needs illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a hard time finding anybody who felt right. Um, the book was published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, a great and venerable publishing house, and I sort of imagined that they would have reams of illustrators to call. They don't. <laughs> they don't really. They have they had some children's books illustrators, uh, but nobody felt who felt. I, I knew. I kind of had a vague idea of the sensibility, which would be sort of, you know, perverse but beautiful. Um, I had a rough sense of the artists we were looking for, and we weren't finding that person. And I finally just Googled illustrators <laughs> and came up with Yuko. Wait, is that how you found me? Yeah. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't tell you that. No. You? No, 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 no. I Googled you. Oh, I, because, had, because, I had zero idea. No one at goddamn FSG was doing shit about it. So Excuse me, I'm sorry, it's Tourette's-like. I, 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 I will try to watch my language. I, I got a call from the cover art director and designer of FSG, who I actually have worked with in the past. And he, you know, he mentioned, like, yeah, you know, Michael wrote in these short stories, and he wants this to be illustrated. And what do you think about it? And, like, 
we think you know you're a perfect match and like I just assumed he found me because you know I have worked with him before but it was a completely different kind of book because I'm a Japanese and I do a lot of um, you know Japanese period style art and it was one of uh, Akutagawa's books so um, it was very period Japanese woodblock print type of work. It's very different. Yeah, yeah. So I'm finding out something but very new. I know, I know, I know. I don't, I don't mind if Rodrigo took credit for it, but in fact, <laughs> it was me, girl. I found you all by myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, no, and, and probably, so just quickly, um, you know, there, there was this incredible work online. It was, it was, it was very Asian, but I thought, oh, the, the sensibility, that doesn't, that's no problem. No, that's, you know, and anybody who can do what you can do, can do anything. Thank you. So, so Yuko, you know, we, and we all kind of grew up with those stories, but also a style of illustration with those stories um, often. And I wonder how you went about kind of sorting through your own sense of parameters. Did you feel um, liberated from the kind of traditional approach, the, the way these are often illustrated, or did you feel like you needed to work within that? So um, it was a very interesting creative process because nowadays, you know, everyone knows in any field, like nobody have meetings. I mean, especially if you're a freelancer and no, nobody calls, like everything's on email. And so I don't see any of my clients, I don't see any of my collaborators for a very long time. But um, FST actually called us to be in the meeting. So we had multiple meetings throughout the stages, different stages, maybe three or four times yeah. over, yeah. over the course of start to finish. So initially, like, let's sit and talk, you know, like, what are you thinking? What Michael's thinking? What we as a publisher thinking? Let's come together and talk. And so that, that was a start. And then also Michael said, like, Yuko, I'm an artist. You know, I write, and that's what I do. And you artists, you draw. That's what you know how to do. So I picked you, and I completely trust what you do. And you come out with something, you know, that you feel is right. And of course, we had then like a meeting follows, and I went to Books of Wonder, which is a children's book uh, store, and which is probably mostly known as the model of. Uh, you got mail. That's where Meg Ryan works. <laughs> and, uh, it's an old location. I asked them actually. Uh, it's an old, old, um, nice uh, children's bookstore. And actually, it's right on the first floor of FSG office. So I went in there, and they have like a different sections, not just the contemporary kids' books, but they have a rare book section, and they also have republished old books. So I read Michael's almost completely finished. You did a little bit of editing, but it was almost completely finished set of stories. And it feels like it's right to use sort of like turn up the 19th to 20th century children's book from, you know, mainly Europe, like England, like really dark line-based work that was popular around that period. And because I do black and white line work, and okay, this direction might work. And I went in before the meeting, it bought a whole bunch of books from <coughs> the time period, and then wrote that in, and we started talking. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, like every time I do some sketches, we meet, and every time I do some more finish, we meet, and then gradually moved forward. And were, were Michael, were there? <coughs> images or things that she had seized on within your stories that surprised you? Yes. And in the best possible sense. <laughs> you want to be surprised. Uh -huh. um, you hope to be pleasantly surprised. And yeah, yeah, I, as, as Yuko said, I, I, um, I felt like, no, I just want, do whatever you want. I mean, <laughs> although this, the prose came before the images. I wanted it to be a collaboration. I wanted Yuko to use the stories as a departure point for whatever she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they started coming in, and 
they were ravishing. I, I, I would just show them to people and say, okay, you're not gonna believe this one. Um, and I, I know you, you, we talked about it, there were a few times where you, you, you thought, well, either this or that, and we talked about that, but essentially, what's in the published version are, are exactly the drawings you, you produced. Um, they're fantastic. They're, 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 uh, it was really interesting to me to see which image from the story spoke to you. And I feel like, well, you talk about two stories getting married. <laughs> I feel like this book is a sort of marriage of the stories and your illustrations, which are distinctly related, but the illustrations are not subsidiary to the stories. The illustrations are almost a book of their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of these stories. I mean, some of the tales that you take on are uh, Snow White mm -hmm. and Rumpelstiltskin, and Jack and the Beanstalk, and um, Beauty and the Beast, and Monkey's Ball, which is not, doesn't always that's show up. That's a bit of a in, cheat. In those... I know, that's not really a fairy tale. I just figure it's my book, I can do what I want. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I want to talk about, and you, I'll take your cues because there may be some specifics about stories you don't want to give away or to reveal, but, mm -hmm. but um, I'd love to talk about the Rumpelstiltskin story if we could a little bit because, I mean, and this, one of the things that's so great about this, this book is, um, you know, the villains, the, 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 people, the people we're not rooting for in these books are, are generally, you know, kind of one dimensional in the stories that, right. that we have read. Right, right, and, right. and so what Michael has done um, consistently is he's taken some of those characters and it's almost as if that's where his sympathies lie. Or at least there's a curiosity and he, he steps back and he says, well, let's, let's kind of maybe probe a little bit about how this character maybe got to this point. And Rumpel's, you know, so with Rumpelstiltskin, there is the notion that he wants the, the, the woman who becomes the queen, he wants the queen's daughter. And of course, we grew up thinking, well, how horrible. Why should Rumpelstiltskin have a child? He's single. You know, he's humpbacked. <laughs> he's, he, you know, he's small. He, that, right. He sh that would be the worst thing. And so, in, in Michael's take, Michael, from the very beginning of that story, says, why shouldn't he have a child? What's wrong with Rumpelstiltskin wanting a child? Yeah. So, did, did that impulse to kind, of, to kind of shift, in some ways, the, 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 the point, not the point of view so much, but, but to focus on the different character than what we were used to, was that a, a, a plan going into the entire project? It was, you know, I hardly ever have a pl anything as, as useful as a plan, but, but I have a sort of sense of smell almost about what I'm doing, and, and then it begins to reveal itself as some kind of something plan-like, and I think maybe the sort of underlying notion of this book is, as you say, the traditional fairy tales, which I love. These are homages. They're not, they're not wise acre riffs on, right, right. There's on, something on, ironic on about archaic yes. forms. These are stories that I still love. And the characters are, in fact, almost inevitably one-dimensional. They're evil or they're good. You know, they're, they're virginal or they're corrupt. And without being so conscious of it, I, I, I guess I was thinking, but what if they were all more complicated than that? Right. What if I, being a 21st century writer, though I dwelt long in the 20th century as well, I mean, it's, I'm all about, like most contemporary fiction writers, human complexity. Mm. No, there's no good guy, there's no bad guy. We're all the good guy and the bad guy. It depends on the day, depends on the, on the situation. And um, you, know, you mentioned earlier that, that the, some of the fairy tales turn, cue pretty closely to the originals and others don't. And what I found was, it's kind of interesting, that, that if, you do, if you try to imagine why Rumpelstiltskin would want a child so, so much. What, what would lead a, 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 a girl to fall in love with, a, with, a, with a, a, essentially a seven foot Yeti in a, in a, in a, in a, in a great coat and a saber? Um, 
if you follow the characters, some of them demanded very different versions of the traditional stories, and some of them made the same story all over again, mm -hmm. which says something about destiny that I'm not smart enough to to, to quite tackle, <laughs> but you know what I'm, I'm saying? Yes, that, that, yes. that some of the existing fairy tales had room for characters with free will and free choice, and they still went exactly where the fairy tale went anyway, and some of them went somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I know that, um, Michael, as a child, your parents read, to you, read these stories to you very often, and they meant a great deal to you. Yuko, I'm, I'm wondering what your relationship was to these stories as a child or, or later in life? or um, I, my, my parents did read a lot to me. And then also, I, I'm a, I was a bookworm. You know, like someone who, it's like uh, after lunch, outside it's sunny and everyone's staying, uh, out, going outside and doing dodgeball. And I'm the one who's staying inside and either reading books or drawing pictures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so um, I, I did. No, except for Monkey Paul, I didn't know. Uh, but like, I knew all the stories. And it's interesting, you know, like, uh, my friends and people I know read it, and there are always different stories they don't know. Like, yeah. oh, I didn't know this, I didn't know that. And there are not many people who knew every one of them. Right. But fairy tales are interesting because Disney has, like, since very sort of like sanitized everything. but. It's really dark and, you know, tragic often, and not many of them happy, have happy endings. So in that sense, Michael's book is more true to the actual fairy tales than Disney's mm -hmm. stories are. It's like fascinating. I ask people, like, do you know how um, Little Mermaids end at the end? And most of the people don't know. Most yeah. of the kids don't know. I teach college art school, and many of the college students don't know. And that worries me. And also, like, it's almost like bringing back what is real in the 21st century way. Would you remind us of how The Little Mermaid actually ends? Wait, you remember, right? I do, I do. Yes. You... So, like, she kills herself, right? Like. Because he, it's Prince Pex, the, the other, other woman who he thought saved him, who didn't. The Little Mermaid saved her, she couldn't say it. And then he picked her, and they get married. And then the, the, the contract was if she can get him, and she will either like turn in, uh, like yeah, she has to kill herself. She kills herself, but she turns into like a water bubble and travels around the world. I think that's, that's the ending, right? Yeah, that's the ending, yes. that's the ending. Okay, just quickly, Sleeping Beauty. Um, the, prin the prince gets into the, into the, into the tower and, and kisses her, no effect. <laughs> he goes off, he does other things. Um, he thinks, oh, you know, I've just been thinking about that, that comatose girl. Um, <laughs> so he goes back and kisses her again, and this time she wakes up, but she's pregnant. This is a true. This is the true original Wait, Sleeping Beauty. I don't know because that. what he, we know what he did to her that first time while she was comatose. <laughs> it wasn't just a kiss. This is the Sleeping Beauty as originally conceived. I did not darken these fairy tales. I did not make them more perverse. No, and then the Snow White kills the evil stepmother yeah. at the end. Yeah. That, that one, I've always liked that one in particular. This? I know, if, I know, I know. If you don't, <laughs> please read them. Like, we're not making this up. Well, I think Snow White is an, is an especially interesting one because, you know, yeah, she kills the stepmother. Um, by the way, the, the prince is just is riding through the forest, and he, and, and, he, and he sees a dead girl in a glass coffin and kisses her. What's that about? <laughs> There's, there must be something wrong with him, right? Well, you know, a, kiss, kiss, uh, you know it, if a, a beautiful corpse is still a corpse, and it's a stranger, and it's in the woods, and there's seven, there's seven little people huddled around it, I might not kiss that girl. No. <laughs> I might. I don't know. But you know, it's just, it's just. I won't. It's just, it's there, 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 there are. You're, you're, I'm, I'm so glad you're pointing this out because they're so, they're so fabulously 
peculiar and perverse and dark. And the ones, the Disney versions that certainly I grew up with, I, this is a whole other conversation, but I don't hate the Disney versions. I, I have complicated feelings about, about, um, about being so terrified of the Arthur Rackham illustrations in the childhood book I grew up with that I couldn't, I couldn't go into the room where it was kept. <laughs> like I wanted to hear the stories. He was my favorite artist growing it's, up. They, 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 but they, they just so freaked me out. Um, and, and like I said, I, I, I think the, the whole, the sanitized Disney versions are not a good thing, they're a complicated thing. But, uh, you know, speaking of the complications, I mean, Michael's the only writer who would take the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and think about later, okay, so they're together, but at some point she feels obligated to have the dwarves over for a dinner party. And they kind of resent him, and so later they're talking about the dinner party, and they say, oh yeah, like that went well. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that Michael is constantly doing in these stories is he is, you know, the stories tend to be very rigid in their endings. They're very final in, in one sense, that, that good has triumphed over evil and what else is there to know? But Michael, you know, in, in these stories comes in and says, but what about the next day? And yeah. maybe six years from now, how are things going in the castle? And... Um, you know, I mean, that ambiguity is, is, I mean, what all writers want, ambiguity, of course, but, but it also keeps these stories from being predictable because there's so many surprises in, yeah. in each of them. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. You know, that actually stems from my childhood when we would, my, my mother mostly would read a, the, these fairy tales to me and she, and she would get to, and they lived happily ever after. And um, it took me a long time to get over this. I would look at her like, go on. <laughs> And she would say, no, that's the end. And I'd say, no, that can't be the end. What happens, what happens to, the, to, the, to, the, to the prince with the, with the one swan wing? What if Snow White doesn't like the castle? You know, what if, what if, what if, what if? And she would just kind of light a cigarette and say, well, that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> Go to bed. So I had, I had, to, do the, I had to do the work myself. So, so this is a question for both of you. Um, I'll start with you, Michael. If, if you had tried this project 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, do you imagine that these, you would have brought different inclinations, insights, and pulps to these stories? Would they have been very different, do you think? Wow, you know, I, I, I imagine they would have been. I mean, I, I hope so. You hope you're not the same writer 10 years or 20 years down the line. Um, I was just talking to somebody about this yesterday. This is, um, I think they would have, I suspect they would have been different in at least one way that comes immediately to mind. When 20 years ago, when I was 50, um, I, um, no, when I was younger, um, say my 20s, I was, um, I was so dead set against anything that suggested sentimentality, hmm. uh, as, as, I, as young people often are, yeah. as my students often are. Some of my most brilliant students are just so terrified of, 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 of sentiment that, that, that what they produce is, is barren and, ice, and like, you know, like an ice cube. Um, and, and we talk about that. Um, and I certainly, now that I'm no longer in my 20s, I no longer feel like, oh, anything that isn't barren and hopeless and wind blasted and without any nourishment or kindness to speak of is no use to me. <laughs> I'm not that guy anymore, <laughs> you know. I hope I, 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 I hope I haven't gotten to, gotten mushy, but but I certainly, at this age, am not as opposed to rampant expressions of love and sorrow as I would have been when I was younger. Yuka, how about you? If, if this had been a project much earlier in your career, I. I I bet it will be different, um, and I, I teach college, uh, college-level art students in illustration classes, 
And I, I also went to the same school as a student and going through four years as a student and then started teaching. And I've been teaching there for, I think, 12 or 13 years. Uh, fairy tales often come up as a, a subject for assignments huh. because everyone knows fairy tales. Everyone has relationship with fairy tales. It's kind of an easy topic to give us to students, but at the same time, it's one of the hardest because like ever since we were a little child, like we we're bombarded with imagery like Disney or not, you know, like dark or happy image of children's books from, you know, like Grimm and Anderson and all those famous stories. And we have certain ideas in our head and it's really, really difficult to get away from it. So if I don't give my students intentionally uh, fairy tale assignment because it's they will come out with something like yeah I've already seen that before and like why are you drawing Snow White this way that's how you remember from Disney movies so there are all these right, things right. that is like keeping you from freeing yourself mm -hmm. so like going back to your question I'm, I hope I'm a better artist than you know when I started. I've been doing this for about 15 years or so. And so if I got this assignment 15 years ago, I would have tried my best, but like how much, how good would I have been to get away from these images that traps us? And the, the better you get, more sophisticated you get as a visual artist or writer or any kind of art form, you know, like is getting away from and it makes it easier for you to come up with something that is fresh. And it's really hard to do in early stage in your career. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm glad I got it. Um, maybe like 12 years into my career. And how I remember this is the first time, so the art director, Rodrigo, uh, who designed this cover to, um, and he called me and he said like, you know, like, you know, Michael's interested in your work. So like, are you interested in working with this? Like, I'm calling you because you're not like one of those young, young talented artists, like who can't yeah. handle this yet. I think you have an ex experience to handle. Like, I clearly remember he said, like, you're not just a kid. I think you can handle this. <laughs> so that, that's my answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I have a feeling that there's probably a group that would like to ask some questions. So um, in the time we have left, we have about 10 minutes. There are two microphones. But if there are questions, we can certainly, uh, we have time, sure. I'm just curious um, about cultural differences. About 25 years ago, I worked in advertising in Tokyo, and one of my clients, I was a copywriter, was um, Shiseido. And so my boss, a Japanese woman, came to me and said, I want you to promote this skin cream because it brings harmony to a woman's life. And I'm going, because <laughs> I was selling to Western women. And I had to convince her that's not going to work. <laughs> So I'm wondering if you had any cultural differences in working as a writer and illustrator. Is it the cultural, the cultural difference, like come, me coming from different background, or cultural difference between artists and writer? You being Japanese. Oh, I've been Japanese. Um, I actually grew up here as a kid, so like I'm, I'm a Japanese citizen still. Uh, and I still have lived in Japan longer than I have lived here. But um, I went middle school in the US. And so that's when, you know, a kids develop their personality and, you know, like sense of identity. So since then I went back to Japan when I was in high school and then came back here. I always feel like I'm neither. And so I'm half and half or like, you know, both. And I miss, I, 
I lack a little bit of like American common sense. I lack a little bit of Japanese common sense, but I'm also well-rounded in both. You know, like you can't be double, like you can't have perfect both. So um, I, I think I'm pretty good. And of course, as an as a artist who's working with my name attached, like I have to, like what I have to do is, I have to do something that is fresh and if my being hybrid makes it fresh, like that, and if that works, that's enough for me. Michael, did you feel any well, difference? Or? Not working with Yuko, but but uh, when I was writing the story, you know, I, I, I read more non-Western fairy tales than I had before, and. Asian fairy tales, African fairy tales are really different. Yes. Profoundly different in, in, their, in their sense of the stories a child should be told. Uh, a lot of them are much more nealistic. Western fairy tales run must much more to, to moral improvement right. than, than a lot of, of, of Asian and African fairy tales. But finally, it was a bit of a no-brainer because I just felt like, um, in another kind of book, you want to try to transcend to the best of your ability your localness, your Americanness, your 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 the tiny your tiny little life, head in your tiny little life. But I could not. It, it, it would have felt so fraudulent yeah. to try to reimagine stories that were not the st stories. I was told as a child that would have felt like some kind of Yeah. Creepy. You're talking about being American. One of the things I'll never forget is my boss was, um, he wasn't my boss, but I worked with him, a creative director. He was Japanese. He didn't even speak English. He'd never been to the US. But I taught him a little bit of English, and he would introduce me and say, this is Nan-san. My name's Nan. She's from New York, but she's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering, have you ever thought of trying a different style when it comes to drawing? Maybe something more like Art Nouveau? Nouveau? Yes, thank for you. For this? No, for anything. If, if the right project comes up, so like the job of, of an illustrator is like, you know, try to do my thing and at the same time, like, pick some concept that works with the problem I need to solve. For this problem, the, how I needed to solve was a turn of the 19th to 20th century European children's book style. So if any project comes up that calls for our nouveau, I will do it. But at this point, I haven't seen it yet. So that's why I haven't done it. OK, thank you. Yes. Michael, you mentioned sentimentality earlier mm -hmm. and about avoiding it. I was just wondering, this is a question for both of you. If you're concerned, if something, whether it's art or literature, is too sentimental, then it lapses into kitsch or it lapses into the territory of being sappy or trite. I mean, is that something that both of you try to avoid? And how do you avoid that? Uh, uh, um, I'm really talking about veering closer to the edge of sentimentality, um, which is which, as, as opposed to staying 10 miles away from it um, so that there's no danger that you will ever be maudlin or mawkish. As I, as I grow older, I'm more interested, not only as a writer, but as a reader in, in, in work that sort of acknowledges our emotionality. <coughs> and is willing to risk going a little too far. And the trick is trying never to go too far. And I'm fortunate in having a small body of terrifically cruel friends who are readers, <laughs> who are merciless. And I really, I have to say that without Ken Corbett and Marie Howe and Adam Moss and several other people, I can't imagine how I would do this because one of their jobs is to say, honey, that's too much. <laughs> and I have the good sense to listen to them. 
So from the artist's point of view, um, I think it's like sentiment is like, well, like there are different definitions. Like, so like, you know, looking back at something and like, oh, that was nice and like try to like recreate that. And what I always keep in mind is like, regardless of what I feel about that nostalgia or time period that I'm looking back to, like we live now and how to bring the contemporary feel to something old. If I'm like imitating something old, in this case, you know, the old children's book, or like maybe Art Nouveau at some point, if I just redraw what was then there, then it's, it becomes kitsch or it becomes just copy. So I try to like put my mindset, yes, I'm doing this, I'm replicating the style, but also, I live now and how to make it look contemporary. And there's like no one way of doing that, but like the mindset really helps, I think. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. Sure. Um, Michael, I have a question. Um, earlier in your career, you focused on um, gay relationships in novels. And I'm a person who's writing about um, controversial subjects. The, the way women are treated in the hard sciences. And I've received so much criticism, and I wonder if you could talk to criticism you might have gotten back in the eight, 90s, I guess, in your first books. Oh, sure. Could everybody hear that? Um, um, you know, I, I've, I think I've always written, a, written novels in which there are gay characters, more gay characters than there are in most books but also straight characters. More straight characters than there are in most books with gay people in them. Um, <laughs> um, I think our situations are different. I think the world's perception, I think, I, I, think, I think the world tortures women in ways slightly different from the way in which it tortures gay men. Um, I, on one hand, this stuff was just sort of ignored. Um, you know, it was it was it was niche writing. It was it was it was the sort of genre known as gay. Right. Um, the back of the bookstore, often. Yeah. Book yeah. Stores, there's that one section of gay literature. But I have to yeah. say, a lot of people, many of them gay. Many of them people whose sexual orientation was whatever it was, but who were especially interested in gay lives, paid particular attention. It was, it wasn't planned, but it was actually kind of helpful to be out there writing about lives that hadn't appeared much, if at all, in, in, in fiction before. Um, and I'm, I'm still slightly surprised, even after all these years, um, that I got, first I kind of got out of the niche and then they just closed the niche altogether. Mm. There aren't gay sections in bookstores anymore. And I, for one, don't miss them. Exactly. You know, <laughs> put the books in with everybody else. Do you have any advice for do you have any advice for women like myself writing on these subjects? Um, off the top of my head, fuck anybody who gets in your way. <laughs> Thank you. That's a pretty good note to end on. I think. Uh, let's have a round of applause for Michael and Yuko for joining us today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.